side of the apps. So you have a, a variety of conditions that might be quite interesting to deal with. This is where we are building now the, the batching plant, two offices in the homes, ceramics area, and then a, a, a metal apps there. This is a large model that uh, somehow was made for the exhibit, but it's very useful now for, uh, to study the, the problems of building. You see the part of the apse, the bridging structure. Those are the columns that, that we have uh, the same kind of floor area in the octagon, in the camp. There you see two figures giving you the idea of the scale. This is uh, 160 feet inside diameter. Uh, this indicates the skeleton, really, of the building. And then uh, each person or each family would mold and define and um, somehow spill out with its own design outside of the, the structure with little balconies or terraces or uh, color or different sizes of openings and so on. Those are the, the tops of the columns making large platforms for uh, like a penthouse, the equivalent of a penthouse. This is a water reservoir. On the east side, the land drops down, so we'll have at this part of this building coming down in there. This is an indication of this uh, somehow uh, personal intervention once the skeleton is built and the building becomes functional. The view from the, from the farmland indicating the importance of the roof as a big uh, umbrella sheltering and connecting the whole building, the different structures in the building. This is a little more detailed study of one of the apses this is the ground level, it might become deeper here according to where the apse is. And this is an indication of the smaller modules in the apse, 17 feet deep, to uh, the possibility of a mezzanine. And they change in character depending on at what level you are because of the spherical shape uh, meeting the horizontal slabs. There you see a difference between a lower level and a higher level. And you look into the landscape there, but inside of the apse, and you, you look into the town there, but outside of the apse. So this, is, this connects you to the cityscape, this connects you to the, to the landscape. No, that's not very clear. This is almost to the top of the, I think it's that level there. Again, this would be the inside when the building is built. Now, we have been building this area, house, office, um, batching plant, storage, and the ceramics work area. We're in the process of building those two. We are building also another app similar to this one for the foundry. This is under in, and inside at the same center of this larger apse. So we are doing now the buildings that are, do not demand the large foundation or footings that this larger structure de demands, but it's part of the building already. And we are occupying all the structure that we are building immediately because we need the space. We are also beginning, a, a, on the opposite side of this one, a um, eating, cooking, and exhibition place. And we are starting now the excavation. So this is the work for this summer, for this year. And that's the end of the slides. As I was saying, I have some material later on if you're interested. Let's see, you know, I'm... Is that my phone working? You have to stay up at a Okay. Can you hear in the back? Would you 
Would you have some questions? One question. Uh, what difficult I have in country in, um, in carry on the idea? <laughs> About a hundred kinds of difficulties. Um, what well, the main uh, the main difficulty is, is to be able to explain the idea, and uh, I'm still trying to explain it by writing or by meeting people and so on. That's really the the main obstacle. Uh, then the fact that you are dealing with uh, with expensive undertakings, it's, a, it's the other obstacle. Then there is the obstacle that you cannot impose those things, you have to have a, a, a consensus. And the consensus comes only if the idea is, is understood and accepted or rejected. Uh, there is then the problem that uh, we are dealing with a pretty conservative uh, society in many ways and, uh, and, and governments. So that when you are dealing with uh, with an idea that has some radical aspects, you're really facing a, uh, the wall of China or you know, something immovable almost, and you're trying to get your voice across. At this point, uh, we, are, we are going on in the scale you have seen, and uh, maybe we are able to in enlarge the activities if we are able to have more people involved. That's why I keep, in, I keep saying this, because it's very important I think the idea is important enough to to um, war, uh, to, to uh, for me to go about in this way and ask for help because I think it's, it would help not just us but uh, men in general. I really believe that the idea is absolutely sound, and uh, I believe this because it it's not an invention of my in, it's an invention of life. Life has been developing this way throughout its own history. So if we plan to have a future, sooner or later we have to go that way. It's just about mandatory. It might be a little too soon, but uh, that's another story. Yes. Yes. Well, we had uh, uh, crowding is uh, is not necessarily uh, an evil thing. In fact, for Europeans, for instance, or for uh, North uh, Africans, it's a, it's a very important thing to have. If you don't have crowding, you seem to be lost. Uh, in this country, uh, crowding is always, has always been seen as some kind of an evil that we have to accept. So it depends very much on, on your background and your outlook, really. But I'm not advocating that much crowding. Uh, it's really the fact that you are overlapping many, many levels of activities. So you, you have many grounds instead of having one ground. It's a three-dimensional topography. And um, this, this is not uh, a whim. It's just because the logistics of a, of a community, especially when it gets to be sizable, are so complex, so demanding that you cannot do it on one level. We know that now very clearly. And in order to organize this, this um, logistical flow, we have to look at what nature has done and take some out the same methodology that nature has been adopting, which is the, the three-dimensional methodology, which is the highly organized methodology. And uh, you have uh, your private uh, life, which can be uh, organized in, uh, in non-crowded fashion, but you know that you are somehow plugged in both the, the natural and the man-made. And this is very important. We, if we believe in the city, we should believe in the fact that we, we, are, we have the ability to reach into the institutions of the city. Otherwise, it's, it's senseless to live in a city and find out that you are a slave of it because it doesn't deliver what you're asking for. At the same time, losing the countryside, as we do now. Yes. Well, there are projects similar to this already going on. You know, we are, we, we are recognizing the fact that uh, we have to reverse the process uh, somehow. 
especially when we are dealing with the, with centers that we believe are going to be of some of sub, sub, sub substance. They are they're not going to be just a, a marketing place with a movie house and a few other things, a restaurant and, and, a, and a parking lot around. So this is happening already in many ways in many countries. Uh, but there is something uh, almost, uh, there's a convergence really of needs at this point that uh, makes this, I think, a mandatory condition. If we really are serious about what pollution is, you know, what the problem of energy are, what the problem of waste are, what the problem of of taking care a little better of the land and, and the sky and so on, we see that there are not too many answers as far as, far as the concept. Uh, you, once you, you get the concept straight, then the answers are multiplying, I mean, are available in, in endless variations. But the concept is that uh, as any manifestation of life is an implosive manifestation, it's really the gathering of things around the center, a magnet which is you, me, anybody in this room, a mouse, a, a, a bug, a fish, anything like that. If this is right, then we have to be very careful to go against this grain, the grain of reality, because this, this is the, re the only reality that we have. It's a reality which has been making itself for about four billions of years. It's, uh, it's, it's a demonstrated reality, and it's the only one, really. The, the question is to be able to move from the single, in, from the individual to the, to the group without, without fearing or believing or, or thinking that this is going to destroy the, the person. I think, well, it's not my thinking, it's thinking of many people. Uh, the person is going to be greater, the, the greater is the community and vice versa. So there is not a divergency there of, of aims or, uh, or um, goals. The goals are, it's one which is transform this, which is, let's say, pure matter, whatever that is, mass, energy, who knows what, into something far more subtle, move from the determinism of the universe, the, the entropic universe, into something which is asyntropic, which is non-deterministic, which is willful, which is moral, which is ethical, and so on, which is aesthetic. And this is a very powerful uh, tide, and to, to understand how far off it is, we have to think in terms of the Earth before life appeared on the Earth, and compare that kind of ecology, a dumb piece of stone, let's say, fiery and whatever you want, to what uh, the ecology is now. We, the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom. So it's not a whim, again, of the imagination. It's, uh, it's the most powerful phenomenon that we know of. And uh, I think we have to be coherent with that. We have to have a, a, a congruence with this phenomenon and not just throw it out because at this point, for reasons, for uh, personal reasons, we believe that uh, this has to be discarded. Yes? The question. Well, you are dealing with a, with a solid instead of with a, uh, a blade or a needle. So the needle would be pretty strong, the blade would not be that strong. But uh, dealing as, as you would be with a, a solid in the sense that as a three-dimensional uh, substance, uh, it would be very strong as far as wind pressures goes. You might have a problem, you might have to be, you know, consistent with the seismics, seismic areas, uh, all, those are all structural problems that come up according to the context of the, of the community. I mean, where it is, what kind of uh, foundation you have to use because of the, of the subsoil and so on. And the size, the height doesn't have to be that much. We have already buildings which are as high as we need to, to develop uh, a three-dimensional city. But uh, there again, it's it's because of, uh, of this necessity of reducing the skin and aug augmenting the, the, the body, the volume, that demands that we uh, gather the things instead of scattering them. If you take a, um, an extreme of climate like uh, the desert or uh, Antarctica, you see immediately why we should pull things together. That's the way to combat the, the climate and to conquer the climate somehow. Yes. Are you 
what would happen on the existing cities? Could you repeat a question? Yeah, I did this time. Uh, well, as, uh, go ahead. I wondered what will happen to the type of cities we have now as the change evolves, if you'll build from them or what? Yes. Well, as you said, you used the, the, the term e evolving, so I think that's the good term. It, anything that has a validity it begins as a, as a small precedent and then is accepted if it has validity and it develops in something larger. And uh, the thing that is, that is substituting probably is, is, is substituted because uh, this sort of thing has less vitality. So the, the one that serves better is going to prevail. So you have a selection, you know, the, the story of the selection of the fittest. The most fitted fit is the one that is going to survive. And I think this goes for, uh, for the animal kingdom and for the urban kingdom. So it would not be that you eliminate the flat city at, uh, you know, uh, overnight and you start to build three-dimensional cities. You keep going, trying to maintain and to preserve and to improve what we have. At the same time, when we do something new, we try to, to make a little more sense of what we do. And then the prevailing one is the one that has been able to, to do more for people than the other one. Yes? Well, uh, I, I'm not suggesting concrete as, as the building uh, material. We are using concrete because it's the only one we can afford. And uh, none of the schemes, the large schemes, evidently could be made in concrete. They would have to be in, uh, in steel or uh, light metals or who knows what we are inventing. But, uh, you know, the flexibility of a certain system is not necessarily tied down with the, with, the, with the material you're using. It's much more a question of design than uh, materials. You are right in saying that you cannot recycle concrete. The question is to see how much energy and how much and how, how complicated is the processing of a certain material to end up with steel, for instance, compared to concrete, or with plastic instead of uh, concrete. It might be that uh, the amount of energy needed to, to, uh, to produce a pound of, plast of plastic material it's more than the equivalent, uh, the, the energy needed to produce uh, an equivalent in concrete. So there's a, in order to really know what's the best way to go, we have to know the, the whole cycle of, that is involved. It's quite possible that plastics are less pollutant, let's say, but it's quite, it's quite possible it's the opposite, I don't really know myself. But we are using concrete because uh, that's the only plastic uh, material that we can afford. And also personally, I. I like it. But as I say, you, shouldn't, you should forget about the evidence you have seen. Try to really uh, look into the concept. And in fact, uh, even in a construction now, we are, I'm not so interested in, uh, in the how, how we do it. I'm specifically interested in the why and the what. What we are doing, why we are doing it. And if the hows uh, are a little you know, primitive or uh, imperfect, that's Uh, that's that's less important, and the reason is that this is a proto this is a prototype, and as a prototype, it can be pretty funny. The important is that to see that if we can if we are able to make it go, fly, move, or uh, do whatever the prototype uh, wants to do. <coughs> yes. Well, that's, that's one, one good reason why concrete, uh, I should, the, the question was, how can you recycle a city, more or less? Well, concrete is not very much, well, the best way, of, uh, the best material for recycling. Uh, steel would be much better. Plastics, we don't know yet. But, um, no, I don't have an answer. 
uh, nature would recycle it in time. You know, we, you visit any any kind of old um, uh, broken down cities, and you see how nature manages very well. But we are too much in a hurry to to wait for those things. So that, that's another reason why we should try to reduce the size of our intervention in uh, you know in whatever the balance is, because we know so little of the balance. And also, we want to get rid of those things when they are not useful anymore. So if we contain our, our activities. Then even if it has to sit there because it's too expensive to take it down, well, it's, it's not that big. It's not that uh, damaging to the, to the local conditions. Yes? Yes, the, the question was, I think we have saboteurs there. The, the question was uh, uh, about the neighborhoods, if uh, how the family if fits in, uh, in the living areas and uh, how, how much gardens or green areas you have on open areas uh, within the different levels. Well, to begin from with the second one, I think you would have a number of areas where you have uh, open spaces and uh, possible gardens and so on. And I think the Japanese garden would be a good example of how to go about it. <clears throat> you would have private terraces that could become little gardens. In fact, if you have a modular system, you can get more than one module or build a little house or put up a tent in the middle of, the, of a little garden in your module. So this would be a question of design and of personal options. Uh, but the main thing would still be that you know that uh, the land downstairs is not uh, a cityscape, is not taken by buildings, by roadways, by traffic, by pollution, by uh, noise and so on, it would be taken by people. The trees, parks, uh, playgrounds, uh, or wilderness, or whatever it, it, the city is in. And this would be uh, very, very close to, to your place so that you can get there very quickly, very efficiently, and at no cost, let's say. The other thing is that by, by plugging yourself I so directly in the city, you might like to, to see your house become smaller because you don't need to have so much in your house. So many things are in the city. So you really can partake more of the public life of the community. Now, uh, by, by putting ourselves away, and by the way, I think this is, this is really a, a withdrawal of society from itself. By putting yourself away from the core city and going out, we can pull all the facilities and we can pull the electronic devices that are going, giving us information and so on. What we cannot pull out there is the, the sap and the, and the character and the quality of the city. That can only be found in the city itself. By doing that, we kill this sap, we kill this creature, and uh, in a way we go, we move really from, from uh, something which has some metaphysical quality to something which has much less metaphysical, metaphysical quality. Uh, so I think that suburbia is a mat materialistic image of, of something which had more spirit into it, into it, which is the city. Yes? Uh, the question is how, how those ideas compare to a habitat? Well, I have to judge only habitat only from what I see, and I haven't been in, so only for what I see, you know, from photographs. Habitat, to me, at this point, as it was built, it's a glorified apartment house, so it doesn't touch the problem of the city as yet. Uh, the other observation that I would make on habitat is that possibly it's not the best fit for that climate, and I would have to go there and live, spend some time there to, to be sure of that. But the, the Montreal climate, I think it's a little too stiff for that kind of organization of you know, outer spaces and, uh, and uh, passageways and so on. But it's mainly that 
I'm talking about not, not of dormitories or of a private sectors of a certain uh, community. I'm talking of the city as a total organism. That's why when, uh, when the question come up, comes up of housing, I think it's, in a way, it's an irrelevant question when it's put in the way we are putting it. Housing for what? We need to house society. We cannot just house people. A housing of society is to build towns and cities is not to build suburban developments, or even Preston's or, or Columbia's by that token. Yes? Well, when I, when I have a, a commission, <laughs> I'll, I'll get the answer. It, the question is, I am in a certain contest now there, so I'm trying to find a solution that I feel they are fit. But evidently, uh, each region and each climate and each geological setup has its own uh, demands. But many of those schemes, uh, I think, would be, could be uh, somehow work out for different climates and different conditions. But naturally, they would be so different from what you see there that they would not be re recognizable. Uh, that's why they are so abstract now that they are dead in many ways. In order to put life into, into an idea, you really have to come down with the idea into actual, into actual you know, contest, into the existential conditions that we are dealing with. Yes? I, um, I really feel that um, it's possibly we are giving a little too much importance in trying to define a political system for an animal that doesn't exist yet. And I, I know that the physical is going to influence the, the non-physical. I mean, that's quite evident. We have been made the way we are because of the environment, or at least half of it. At the same time, I really think that there is a certain precedence of the instrument on the performance of the, the instrument. So that, I, and this is, this is happening with us, for instance. We are just beginning now to have, a, let's say, a, a small society, very primitive. We are really in the wilderness. We have no facilities, but we are starting to see what the political problems are, the social problems are. But we are going to development, develop them according also to the environment that we are creating. So I think I, I don't have any qualms about being uncertain about what political system. And also because I really feel, again, that this is an instrument, which means it's a necessary device to be able to serve people but it's by no means a sufficient device to produce a good society. The good society can only come with good people. At the same time, the good people can only reach a level of non-frustration and somehow of, of fulfillment in an environment that it's really serving them. Yes? Well, yeah, I, when when we when I get to this point, I I tend to make the comparison with you know with the jet, genetical evolution, genetic evolution, the the technological uh, development and the creative process, and we see that the genetic evolution happens by the by the technique of uh, function following form. We we genetic developed through this fact that something happened to us the form and then we find a function for it. So it's the reversal of, of the functionalist that says that form has always to follow function. Genetically, it's the opposite. So that's, that's one thing to keep in mind, and I will come that, to that later. Technology has to act in the opposite way. Technology has to answer very sharp, sharply defined functions. So it better work, function follows, form follows function. I had to make a microphone, so I had to make a microphone that answered the, the function that is has to perform, so the form is defined by the function, at least it should be. So technology goes according to this functional criteria. Creatively, uh, again, we might go back to the function follows form, because uh, a creative act becomes the function of itself. When, before you have it, you don't know what it is. When you have it, you know what, what it does. So uh, you start with the function follows form genetically, you get into the technological, which is form follows function, and you get into the creative, and you might go, which is again, function follows form. 
And this is very important, I think, because it indicates that once, when we are to plan something which is not a specific instrument, very defined and very limited, we cannot uh, live in the illusion that we are going to know everything we are doing. Mo most of, of it probably, and the most important, it's really an, an act of fate and uh, an impulse that we have to follow, and, uh, and then we'll find out why, the genetic way. The good example is the, the neck of the giraffe. The neck of the giraffe doesn't develop because the, the, the animal wants to reach the leaves there. It develops because there is a mutation in the, in the animal that produces a longer neck. It just happens that the longer neck helps the giraffe to survive, so that's the mutant that is going to, to develop itself and going to survive. So it's going to fit a certain environment, not because it, it has found a form for a function, but because it has to find a function for a form. Yes. Well, I, I really believe that, uh, I think many people by now believe that uh, because of the changing, uh, mainly the technological appeal, the, the economic structure is going to change pretty drastically. But the, even if it wasn't so, though, the, the problem is that we are not able in, uh, again, uh, as, as, yet, as yet to make use or whatever we, we are taking from the earth in, in the best way. And uh, the most fantastic example is the, the automobile. I mean, if there is something which is really crooked and uh, at this point just about criminal is what we do with the, with the automobile. I mean, we had, trans we had set up a, a whole continent and now Europe is doing the same thing for a certain device which we know ex very well it doesn't, doesn't serve us in, in the way that we ask to be served by. And this is not a small thing, this is a, uh, within the context of the earth is a cosmic mistake and you know, we are paying dearly for. We are paying dearly for, our, our uh, children are going to pay dearly for. And uh, the wish is that, for instance, the Chinese will be able to bridge from the, the pre-technological society to the post-technological society without having to go through this thing. Yes. It, it depends very much on how you look at the, at the cost of something. I, for instance, if you're a country that has a certain budget, and this country wants to move to a, a, a certain level of, uh, let's say, of proficiency, then I think that uh, for an investigation which is a total investigation, this, this is the way to go. Because if you think of the cost, not only of building the cities that we have now, uh, I don't know how large is this city, uh, five miles by five miles, five by 10, 50 square miles, well, this is a gigantic structure. And it's gigantic in the making, to make it, and, and it's, uh, it's very expensive to maintain and to serve. Think of the thing in terms of, all the delivery system that you have to, to have in this city, all the retrieval system you have to have in, in this city, the cost of, of maintaining the system, the cost of the bureaucracy involved in, in, maintain, in getting those services going, the cost of the administration of those things. And all those costs are far higher than what they should be because we are dealing with a giant that doesn't work very well. If you can get a, a smaller creature, you cut down all those costs to maybe a fraction of what uh, the costs are now. Think uh, again in terms of, I don't know, uh, uh, garbage collection. If you need uh, 100 people collecting garbage in this kind of scheme, you might need 10 in the other kind of scheme. And that means cutting down the cost of the services, cutting down the cost of the bureaucracy of the services and so on, which by the way, entails a change of, of uh, political structure, social structure, morals and so on. Multiply that by, by all the services you are dealing with, so you find out at the end probably that this is the frugal, the frugal way to go. Many of the things we do now are invisible, so think we, we think we don't pay for it. Well, we are finding out that we are paying for it dearly. Uh, 12 billion a year for pollution in the next five years, just to keep things as they are now. Well, that's a pretty expensive price tag. And that's only one very little aspect of what, what the problem is. Take the car out of the city, you take the, about 50% out 
of the pollution problem out of the city. And I'm just touching on some of the points to indicate the, the drastic cut that you can have in, in cost, in actual cost. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in a way, this, this is a country in the most desperate need of, uh, of becoming more realistic. You know, we, we in a way are the, are the parasites now because we are consuming uh, what is half of the wealth of the, of, the, of, the, of the globe, and we are 6% of the population, 2% of the population. I don't, I don't remember the figures, but so that there will be an answer there. The other one is that I, I just happen to be in this country, and uh, it would be very difficult for me to go to somewhere else and start all over again. Yes. Yeah, I would say that there are two parts of the same thing, but one somehow it's one on one end, on one pole, the other is at another pole. Which means again that if if I if I need to invent an instrument like this, I I, I know specifically what I want to. I'm going to go after it in a very in a very different way by by uh, somehow screening my mind away from everything else. And what I do, I, I impose my own let's say will. On, on exterior uh, matter and using energy which is outside of me. But if I am, let's say, if I'm thinking in terms of, of composing a piece of music, then that's inner. And um, the technology is an inner technology. This is, a, in a way, it's an outer technology, but uh, at the end, they, they are all part of the same phenomenon, which is, I think, this uh, necessity of life of taking more and more of, of what matter is and transforming it more and more in what spirit is, which, by the way, is, is where pollution and entropy coincide, coincides. I think to understand pollution, we have to understand what entropy is. And then we find out that whatever is entropic is pollutant. Whatever is asyntropic is non-pollutant. And then maybe we find out fewer things about, again, the automobile and uh, affluence and opulence and few other things. Yes, one more. Yes. Well, this is not necessarily so, though. Uh, this country, as a, as I uh, one of the qualities of this country is that to make up our own minds sometimes and do things in a, you know, in a very substantial way. And we see that in, uh, in uh, Vietnam, how substantial we were. So substantial that, uh, I mean, we are just, uh, well. So it, it could be that if, if the problems are, are seen more and more clearly and uh, if the conditions are, are uh, getting worse, which probably they will be worse for, for a while before they, they level off. It might well be that this country might, might decide to do something about it. I don't think we are doing very much about it at this point. I think we are still really touching the surface. And the pollution question is, is a very good example. We are now convinced that once we, we clean up the engine of a car, once we clean up the, the smokestacks, we got it. Well, we haven't got it. The pollution is not the smoke from the, uh, from the stack. Pollution is the car, the garage, the parking lot, the, the highway system, and all those things. And you put them all together, you find out that uh, instead of be having this much pollution, we have this room full of pollution. And that, if you, if you move in other sectors, you might find out it's the same. So the, I don't think we are touching into uh, the, uh, the real problem, really, as yet. So there is a certain fashionable you know, uh, interest on those matters. There's a certain work going on, but uh, we haven't got there yet.
I would like to announce that there will be a reception for coffee and more informal conversation just following this back in the Oak Room. There will be also a, a session tomorrow morning in the council chamber from 9 to 12 that Mr. Soleri will be in more informal discussion with anyone who is interested. And uh, at this point, Paulo, we certainly want to thank you for stretching our thinking at this particular point. Thank you.